I know what it's going to be like when we step into that Kinnick crowd. This is an Iowa team that has a chance at a Big Ten title. It's going to be a serious moment. If there is any sign of weakness shown by that Minnesota team, this could be a game where we take an early lead and we run away. Welcome back to the ANF Podcast, where we cover Iowa sports. Today, we're going to be covering the gigantic win that we had against Wisconsin, and then moving into a preview of the Minnesota game and wrapping up some picks. I think initial takeaways, we knew going into the season this was going to be a gigantic game mm -hmm. uh, within the fixture of the Big Ten West. After we've seen how the rest of the West has played out, we right. knew this was essentially going to decide the season. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we got a win, uh, this is the best I've felt about Iowa football in probably about two and a half years. Yeah, and I think you you have the scope of the season. like It, it puts us in you know the driver's seat of the Big Ten West, but also... You know, I made we made a point in the previous episode how important it was for the idea of Iowa football and the idea of this philosophy we're playing. And it was it drove home the very crux of how Kirk wants to win its games and how he wants the program to win, how you win the Big Ten West. And truly, Wisconsin, with their new system, kind of made some bad game plan decisions. You know, they threw the ball 50 times during a game and gave the ball to Braylon Allen 18 times. And that kind of decision, we, we brought it up in the preseason, we brought it up before the game. You know, Iowa still knows how to win. And what they're doing, the core of what their program is built on, it can still win the big games on the road in a, in a massive moment for the season. Yeah, I think there's few teams in the country that could be down their, essentially their top three players on offense mm -hmm. and still come away with a win. And the way we did it, as you mentioned, Dominating in a run game, it's it, it feels very helpless when you're the opposite side of that. Right. And then when you would punt it deep, I mean, the longer that game went on, once you punt it deep, you really had no fear yeah. of Wisconsin driving the field. In, in a sense, I bet Wisconsin was hoping we'd put the ball in the air. Yeah. Hoping we would make a mistake. But Kirk just kept on running. Yeah. And he said, we're going to pin you deep, and you have to go 90 yards to win this game with a backup QB. Prove and it. it was a completely prove it moment. And he just kept on playing the hand over and over, kept on rolling the dice, but... He truly had the advantage the entire time with the field position and that backup QB that there was no reason for him to, you know, really open the offense up. Well, I think this is also like going into Kirk's style. Uh, when we took a 7-0 lead, I became so confident in that moment. Right. Because when you play this style where it's uh, you're going to not make mistakes on offense, you're going to attempt to control the ball when you have the ball, you're going to try and, you know, create some time in possession. Yep. And then you're going to punt it deep and then have a defense that can back up very well. Mm -hmm. you know, the whole idea of Iowa football is that when we are backing up, we're not going to give up the big play. Yeah. And a lot of teams can say that, and you can see a lot of teams go into these shell defenses mm -hmm. late in games and, and try and execute that. But if you don't have players who you believe in the system right. and they don't tackle well, that mm -hmm. really falls apart. But when you when we take a 7-0 lead, it yeah. can almost feel like a three-score lead at points. Well, it, you know, I've, we've posted this stat to Twitter before, but now Iowa is 69-2 and two with an eight-and-a-half-point lead in the last since 2015. And it wasn't a seven, you know, it wasn't an eight and a half point lead till late in this game, but the seven point lead behaves a lot like a lot like it with the defense we play. It does. You're you're consistently playing against a defense that's giving you four yards, but it's never giving you forty. Yeah. And the stress that puts on a team, and the kind of you know feeling you have starting drives where you know it's going to take twelve plays to go the length of the field minimum. Well, and, I, I text you. I I said at halftime. I was like. I, d I think we're only going to need a field goal, which, I mean, that sounded like a lot just given how we were playing at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the only way they score is through field goals going out. Yeah. And then they took the day of the opening two drives for field goals. I was like, okay, here we go. Right. Like, we can now lose a game by giving up three field goals. Yeah. It was just a quintessential Kirk Ferentz game. And I think that's like the summary of the, you know, entire moment, you know, what happened. And yeah. I think now we can get into breakdown of actually how, you know, the defense and offense played. Uh, but before we do that, we want to, highlight uh, one thing we understand there's you know a, a good portion of you that's coming back and watching a lot of our content uh, watching the majority of our videos as well uh, we just ask you to subscribe to the channel um, it really helps the channel grow uh, and doesn't cost you any money right it's for free there's all you do is just click that subscribe button it helps the channel grow you can helps. sign up with a gmail account you know it's fairly easy exactly so before we get into the breakdown just want to highlight that quickly um, but now to start with our uh, defensive performance. I think you have to start with Sebastian Castro. Um, he's been showing flashes of this game his entire career. And if you want to actually pause this video right now and watch probably my favorite four and a half minutes of football, uh, pull up his huddle senior year uh, highlight film. It is probably a, like our favorite highlight film we've ever watched of a recruit. It is the Wisconsin game, but like 20 plays of him just decimating players. 
Well, that's what's cool about this is we, when we originally reviewed his recruiting film, uh, he was a fairly big recruiter. I think he had offers from Michigan State in Minnesota. It's like mm -hmm. a five, seven, three star. Yeah. Uh, we knew exactly how well he's going to fit into the system. But again, we mm -hmm. had little worries about his past coverage and still he's gotten a lot better. And obviously he's had some huge picks in like games. But he still yeah. lacks, you know, top end speed. We're a little tack him downfield. Mm -hmm. uh, but we always knew he was going to be a destroyer in the flats. Yeah. And he's honestly evolved to basically a clone of Amani Hooker. Mm -hmm. Where the point where you can't block him even with the tight end. He's going right. to erase those plays. Well, and, I don't uh, know why any team would ever design a bubble screen to his side. Yeah. Every time I see a flat play with a blocker in front of him, I'm like, that's the worst idea. If you turn on any film from the last year and a half of him in that cast position, he annihilates those plays. Well, the funny thing is we, we mentioned this after the Michigan State game in our, in our preview to the Purdue game, uh, but how Michigan State utilized the screen game was actually very effective. You've seen Purdue and Wisconsin both try to copy that behavior. Mm -hmm. The problem is how those two teams have differed is they're telegraphing a lot more. In this game against Wisconsin, uh, you would constantly see tight ends lined up in uh, slot positions or in a three wide receiver set where the tight end was actually in the center position. Mm -hmm. and just give you a, a pre-play tell that you're likely going to see or have the potential to see a screen and you see Castro react very quickly to it. Mm -hmm. How Michigan State used it was motion late. Right. And then they actually block Castro with a receiver while he's moving laterally rather mm -hmm. than letting him... And not anticipating... There's no anticipation to it. Right. But these last two teams have tried to copy that behavior. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to how Iowa plays defense, when you let these guys think through a process and they can see a set early right. and they're not trying to you know think through what their reads are, what their keys are, they're just playing football, mm -hmm. that's an area where you can have guys make you know, big time plays and big time moments where they have a guy accounting for him every single right. play. He's just beating him and making the play. And that mm -hmm. he ended essentially ended like three or four drives on the right. Some big third downs. He made yeah. some big plays on. And I think another thing we anticipated to see in that game was the cornerback step up and continue to pressure these uh, big 10 West receivers. Wisconsin's definitely probably the best big 10 West receiver group left in the division. Yeah. I mean, I, I anticipate Paul to be good. He was better than I anticipated. Uh, Bryson green made some plays. I didn't expect him to make. Um, but in the end, only one deep shot was completed against Iowa. Yeah. So that is, you think back to the Purdue and Wisconsin, both, you know, playing these aggressive sets, you've had one PI call and one high point play. And it's truly, you know, broken down some Purdue and Wisconsin possessions. You think back to the seven to three lead Iowa had and Wisconsin was driving the ball by running the ball and really giving Braylon Allen the ball, you know, five or six times on one possession after we were already on the field for a long possession before then. So the defensive line was kind of tiring out. It was a first and 10 on like our 35. And they took a deep shot to, I think, DK. Yeah, at Jamari. On Jamari. Yep. And it was incomplete. Yep. And it went from being a first and 10 to a second and 10. And they got off script. They got they got behind the chains. And it's the air raid coming to bite Wisconsin in the ass. Because the way their offensive line was blocking, the way Braylon Allen was running, they should have ran him 40 times, 30 times minimum in that game. And they would have under Chris. And they would have under more physical coordinators. But they couldn't talk themselves out of the deep shot. And consistently on first down and second down, they would throw the ball. And Iowa pressing those receivers and pressing that moment to say, please throw it deep, waste it down. And not having the success, like they didn't have the success, the success they wanted in those shots, it really flew up, like threw off the complete flow of their offense. Well, I think... When you watch a game back, you always get to have different perspectives on it because you're not, you know, nervous in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my big takeaway was how impatient they were. 100%. And this, again, goes back to game flow. And right. how when we take a lead, teams can get into a sense where they get a little scared about having to go 12, 14 plays. Right. They know that how difficult that, that's, that task is going to be. And then also they're terrified of the red zone. Most mm -hmm. of these spread teams aren't going to execute very well in the red zone especially against a very well-disciplined, dis well-tackling team. Right. So then when you get into those areas where all of a sudden you're 25 yards out, even they took a shot from their own 30-yard line where they tried to hit a deep post, yep. it's moments where they have to almost talk themselves into it because they don't believe in the long game. Right. And that's just, that's how we win. They want that explosive play so badly. Yes. They understand Iowa's metrics too that Phil's based his entire defense off. It's like if we have less than two explosive plays, we win like 90% of the time. And so they're, they're thinking in their own mind, yeah. we need those explosive plays. And I think what gets lost on these coaches is when you're playing from behind against Iowa and why this always ends up looking so good when we are playing from a uh, playing ahead yeah. is when Phil Parker has a lead, the odds of him, a cornerback 
biting on a double move, mm-hmm. him calling an aggressive set where he gets beat deep is almost zero. Right. Like he's reiterating before they go out, do not get beat over top. Do not get beat over top. Mm-hmm. And then if you if you send a, a team out there with that mentality and they're completely comfortable, like we can give up a field goal here that hurts us 0%, mm-hmm. that marrying of a team trying to then be aggressive against you with right. that teaching against them, it just results in QBs getting nervous, missing throws. They realize how on time and like perfect they have to be. And that's what and it falls apart You fast. saw from Mordecai in this game was Mordecai was – missing balls to the outside, to the sideline, and missing low. So in his mind, he was over, like you could tell probably by the third possession, his eyes were not giving him confidence. He's starting to like, I'm seeing, he's seen a little bit of ghosts, yep. and he started to lose confidence in his long throws over to like to the far side of the field. Yep. And where the point where he was dirtying random balls with no pressure, and he was pushing balls to the sideline because he was worried about that pick six. And he, he just completely lost confidence of like well, how to play an air raid offense where you have to be humming with confidence yep. and rhythm the entire time. He lost it early and he never recovered from his, you know, I think even if you played the rest of the game out, he would have been the worst QB option because he was mentally spent by halfway through that first quarter. Well, that That is just zone defense. What you described though, mm-hmm. for like a team teams in college, so rarely play a team that's actually well disciplined in zone. You see a lot of teams run zone. It's more of just a cop out. So they don't get beat deep, right? You know, they're just running it to just kind of give up a change of play. Mm-hmm. We're so well taught in it. Like when those QBs, you see a deep curl, you're throwing to the wide side of the field at ten yards. Right, that's a long ass throw. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you leave that inside a touch, you don't get the arm strength you need on it. Mm-hmm. There's a guy looking at you breaking on that ball. It's right. not like man to man. You yeah. know, he's the guy's not focused on the receiver. He's focused on you. Mm-hmm. And that just added pressure over and over again, asking them to like execute this actually very difficult task. Right, it seems easy, but. For the life of you, go out and throw a wide side of the field curl route and see how hard it is to get the ball there. One hundred percent. So that that again, like that's just that lead mentality. And mm-hmm. When Iowa gets to play with the lead, that defense looks great. Right. I think it's time to move on to the offense. You know, I, this I had to watch this game uh, the last two games because I've been in Europe on my honeymoon. Uh, I've had to watch these last two games on the ESPN play by play, and I would recommend that to absolutely no one <laughs> if you care about a game. I w- just looking at an ESPN app <laughs> while your heart's thumping, you feel like the weirdest person alive because you're right. just watching. And I was, play after play. And I was uh, watching the game, and I, I every single break I had to text Connor what my thoughts were, my constant, essentially conscious of what I was in, like experiencing. Sometimes you wouldn't, so I'd be sitting in the dark for a bit. Or, I'm sorry, I couldn't do it every <laughs> five <laughs> minutes. But you're just trying to download everything I'm seeing. I'm like, run game looks good. Yeah. Stop in the run. Yeah. Mordecai looks rattled. And so you were experiencing that by yeah. that in the ESPN then, app. So you're just getting this like, completely disjointed like yeah. view of it. Yeah. Um, but continue, yeah. But coming back, and I finally got to rewatch the game today. It was amazing how well guard center guard played. Mm-hmm. That that's the best guard center guard play I think we've seen. It's the best O line play since twenty twenty. It could be at guard center guard. It could be longer. Yeah, I, I don't know if we saw a single breakdown, a single miss block from those three players. I think you saw uh, Logan Jones missed a D tackle uh, on a, a backside. Uh, Logan got beat on a a, a, a a twist blitz from linebackers on a pass play. Yeah. Other than that, though, I mean, you're talking about two plays and actually a, and a run in the second half, a, a nose tackle. He had a reach, a really long reach. The announcer called it out as well, saying like he had to go two gaps over. Yeah. He just missed. But like truly, I still agree. Like the push, the assignments, the and what we saw too. Uh, it was a, it's a tactic I didn't quite understand. It's, it's probably, again, a, a predication of a team that hasn't played a lot of power football, mm-hmm. played against a lot of power football this year. They're, you can tell their scheme is set up to play these spread teams. Right. And early in the game, they were not, well, we've seen kill Iowa zone for the better part of five years or even longer than that, mm-hmm. especially on a Wisconsin, is their backside C gap defender has crashed so hard against us right. that our backside zone cut is been, has disappeared. And it, and it has been unreal athletes. Yes. It's been Schobert, Beagle, Watt, yeah. Herbig. Like All in those NFL. outside linebackers on that backside, you know, C-gap coming down the line were insane players. So yeah. like it, our outside zone never worked because you never had no, no cutback. They did make one change, though. When they started going nuclear, when, the run, when they're down by a seven, and it was pretty clear Iowa was just going to be comfortable running the ball every single play, they started bringing a safety off backside yeah. and slanting their backside C to the point where he had no responsibility to play you know, D to the sideline. And so you saw these C-gap guys where they just were unblocked, but they were chasing, and the safety was coming backside as well. Where well they, but it was actually cool, though, because so they, they actually they, so they had that off 
safety, mm-hmm. blitzed on C early against us, which you saw teams do incessantly against us against Petrus because he just always checked into that. Like, right. That's what I've noticed a ton out of this year is we don't check into stuff at all anymore. Mm-hmm. I think that's really stopped. We complained about this preseason, about mm-hmm. how we'd always kind of leave our QB out there to make decisions. Yeah. And then these D coordinators could set up little traps for them like this. Yeah. And we haven't seen a lot of checks. But this one, it was just a straight zone run, and their safety came late, blitzed off C and made the play. And I was like, okay, there it was. Like, we've seen that play for years now where they'll pl- show like a weak side right. off coverage and come late. And they'll right. It rolled uh, late, yeah. But now we have a counterpunch. It was so cool because we've been calling for this jab counterpunch. Mm-hmm. And we had a jab. We started off, we could run interior zone and have backside C cutbacks yeah. that were hitting. But now with that counter play, if you're going to come hard off C gap, you can take yourself out of that play with those two backside pullers. Mm-hmm. So we right. got beat on that. And then we came right back to that same look, but pulled two guys and they kicked him out. It didn't yeah. go for more than two, but you had Caleb with a one-on-one with a guy in the hole. Right. It was like, oh shit, that's the concept of this offense. Yeah. We can we can beat you in two different ways. It's either you're gonna or if you're coming hard off C gap, yeah. then we're gonna start hitting you with counters. If yeah. you're gonna play it slow and play the play uh, the boot action mm-hmm. or play whatever you are, I don't know what the oh, hell that, they're playing. That, but that safety uh C gap actually just reminded me that's what Michigan did in the second half of the 2021 Mich- uh, Big Ten game. Yeah. It was that they just would run backside C and they have the boot be locked up. Yeah. But now we're not countering with the boot. We're countering with the power back yeah. with two blockers. It's actually, it's a great, it's brilliant. Great addition. It, it was, it was one of those times where I've, I've felt like I was on the front step on right. offense. It's like, but you, again, you, what you need is that lead zone, right? The jab, you need the jab. Yeah. And once we are started executing that jab and they started getting a little worried about it and they start seeing that backside C hit mm-hmm. one of it was perfect. They got killed on a backside. It was actually the, the possession where we, Hit our field goal, go up 10, Seven to six. 10 six. Yeah. Uh, we hit LeSean, uh, uh, Williams for a backside cutback on C gap. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I, in my head, as I was watching, I'm like, I bet they're now going to blitz C. Yeah. You see the blitz C on the next play. We run wow. the counter. Right. It goes for 10. I was like, holy shit, it's, it's happening. We're right. doing it. We're yeah. finally like, we have a, a one two punch. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just gives me so much confidence in this team going right. forward. And I think you bring up Williams. You have to bring up his performance. Yeah. His <laughs> touchdown run, I couldn't believe it. Like, I was watching it with my family, and when he broke free, I, I held my breath. I was like, he might score. Yeah. Because I couldn't believe how he got through the line first off. It looked yeah. like he had a free run D tackle. Then it felt like he had three guys that could have made a play. And then for him to bounce off a tackle, stiff arm, and then get free, I'm like, well, he'll be caught at the 10-yard line. Yeah. Was my guess. Yeah. And he just kept going and going, and I was like, it was one of the most big-time runs in Iowa football history, like under with the Kirk at the helm. Yeah. It's the longest run since like 1970 in no, conference I think play. It's 90, 90, it's, it's Tavian 70. Banks in like any season, but in conference play, it's like the 1970s. Really? Like, so it was insane. It was probably the longest 82 yard run of all time. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of seconds. In terms yeah. of seconds. But like, it wasn't just that run for Bichon. It was the entire game was, he, he ran so he hard. He great. got incredible rhythm. He played with so much confidence. He fought through, you know. Contact. Contact. And- he you could tell he's accelerating. He could see holes faster than he's ever seen them. It was just a hell of a game by him. And he got put on the RB1 to start this game. I was like, yeah. Like, if you're going to run that hard and that quick to the hole in the way we're opening these holes, put him out there. Because, like, he got eight yards a lot when we were supposed to get, like, three. Yeah. And he's playing the correct scheme, and Kirk kind of hyped him up in the preseason. And I kind of brushed it off. I'm like, oh, you know, Senior, some older back. Major junior back. Everyone's hyping up Caleb. Kirk's just giving him, in, you know, his – bonus he needs you know is his respect he needs for working hard but like that game was like this is a back that fits our system you have this physical quick back that can make those extra yards and if he's seeing the holes and playing fast like he is and keeps playing with confidence like that is a real dynamic running back to add to the system yeah and uh, it's it's a fun thing to go back and watch if you guys are watching the highlights i'm sure if you've gone back a couple times but on the play he broke it on so richmond actually he had a, a difficult inside reach block he gets shucked. So then they have a free backside D tackle. Yeah. Not in the hole, but he's hole adjacent. Yeah. And how it's funny how it lines up. So it's D tackle, linebacker stacked over him, safety stacked over him, and they're all kind of in a line. Mm-hmm. I think the D tackle is so big that when he takes a step to the right, which he so LaShawn like hit him with a quick like left step before he cut it up. Mm-hmm. Uh the Linebacker and safety both took a step with the D tackle. So mm-hmm. it was just one of those moments where it all lined up perfectly. They didn't really have an eye on the backer. Right. And they all step at the same time. 
and he beats all three of them with one cut. And it was it's such a cool run to watch because you can see uh, Williams when he sees it's open, how fast he gets to the hole. Like he swats the first guy's hands away, stiff arms he the can second. Smell it. Yeah, and it, it it's just a beautiful run. Mm-hmm. And like I think that moment is what you're talking about. That confidence he got from that moment, right, where he can start seeing things fast. And you've seen him again. You know, Western Michigan he started get, like getting confidence when he. But it was with, against lesser opponents. It wasn't like a, a massive moment like that. Like, yeah, this is the plays that college football players they're playing on such a stage. Yeah, they're playing in these huge games and like there has to be some self doubt oh, at yeah. all points of like, am yeah. I really this type of caliber of player? And to have such a validating moment in such a big game in the season at, at Wisconsin where no one runs well against him. Like it would not surprise me if that just leads him into a different part of his career at Iowa. Yeah. Like where he's like, yeah, I'm good now. Yeah. Like I just, I have the confidence and ability that if I play fast and I play hard, like it's going to work out. Well, it's great. Now, you know, Jazz has played a little bit in this game. Mm-hmm. But you've had backs, you know, break a run. Three different three backs different break backs. 70-yard runs this year. The explosive run is back in Iowa football. And, like, if you can come out and and scare teams with your run game, mm-hmm. you know, if, we're, if you're not coming fast enough, you're not coming aggressively enough to stop a run, mm-hmm. you could get busted on. Yeah. That is actually, like, a very important for how we play football. Right. And, again, it's 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 got so many 2015 parallels. Mm-hmm. You know, when you had... Uh, Wadley, Wadley, Kinziri, LaShawn, even Derek Mitchell Jr. Right. You had different guys. Whoever was in rhythm that day, you could just give the ball to. Right. You feed the hot hand. And while it is, it's it's very comparable to what we saw from uh, the 2015 win at Wisconsin, which was oddly enough 10 to 6, which we, the point was that, uh, the score was that point. Mm-hmm. It does fit in also to that Northwestern game the week afterwards. I think maybe it was two weeks afterwards. Mm-hmm. Where you went on the road to the ranked Northwestern team, who is the presumable favorite in the Big Ten, and you had to go to their place. Yeah. And you beat them, and you beat them running the ball too. Yeah. And hopefully the snowballs, because what we've seen from Kirk Ferentz's teams for so long is we start slow. You know, the run game takes a long time to develop throughout the season. But once you get into late October, November, right. that old line starts to get cohesive. Even yeah. last year. And had, it, it was cohesive at the start of the season. Yes. Like we saw it from snap one, game one. There wasn't run-throughs in Utah State and Iowa yeah. State. There wasn't the movement we wanted to see, Yeah, but there wasn't assignment breakdowns. And now you're starting with the a, – just a, the O-line was more successful earlier on this season. Like, I have very high expectations for the rest of the season. Just to be, like who we're playing against, you know, the personnel they're going to have on the D-line and, and the front seven – and the run game as a whole could lead us to... Well, you, just, you just package the, how the line's playing. Right. The blocking tight ends we have mm-hmm. and the three-headed monster. Yeah. Like, there's a there's going to be a good chance we run for 200 yards or close to the rest of the season. Right. And it's because we might hand the ball 45 times a game. <laughs> Truly. And I think that's... Like, we've, we're hyped up the offense. I think we have to talk about two negatives. Yes. Just to balance out the episode. Uh, fourth and three call um, on our first possession that got into Wisconsin territory. I think you might have a better take on it than I do. Yeah. But. Well, it's just, it's funny because I, when I took that play in, I had to take it on. Nico Regani rushes for five yard loss. Mm-hmm. And I, I immediately text you, jet sweep. And I'm like, wait, they wouldn't do a jet sweep on a fourth and three. That doesn't make sense. I'm like, right. they didn't do the reverse out of shotgun, did they? And <laughs> he goes, like, and you said reverse out of shotgun. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and then, okay, like, that, I thought it was a bad play call. Right. And then you go out and watch it. It's a reverse to the wide side of the field. So mm-hmm. Deanne's going to have a thought I have outside contained. Right. I'm the wide defender here. Mm-hmm. Uh, this goes in the Brian's tendency thing. I'm sure there's some stat out there where it's like regain. He's gotten the ball one time. On he's been in motion 40 times this year. Yeah. He's gotten the ball zero times. So he thinks he's playing this whole thing out. Like, you know what? In the Wisconsin uh, defensive room this week, they called out regain. He never gets the ball in motion. Don't I'm respect give him. him. Yeah. They don't respect him, but it's just not how life plays out in right. football. And that's where his tendency thing breaks down for Brian a lot. Because you ask, your fake on the play is an inside zone. Right. It's nothing scary. It's nothing scary. It's a yeah. fourth and three inside zone. You're, yeah. the, t- the defense is begging you to run that play. Right. So no one takes a second step. Yeah. The defender, the, 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 the actual the DN who breaks the play up, immediately goes flat to the line. Right. He does not have a go call on. Mm-hmm. If it was a C-gap go, it actually probably would have been a great call. Right, because it would have actually been, a, been a safety versus... Safety the, versus the bowling or, or, Ortworth, whatever his, yeah. his name. It would have been, and, and he would have been, wrapped him and regained him out of the guy around the edge. Right. But it wasn't a short yardage enough play to have a DN crash. That is the key. Yeah. It it makes zero sense on fourth and three. Yeah. On fourth and one, where you feel that inter- like pressure 
as a front seven player where I have to shoot the gap. It's like almost like a, you see the sneak where they fake a sneak and they jet it. Yeah. Like, or or the fullback to the pitch. As a long fourth and three, nearly a fourth and four. Yeah. There is no, oh crap, like my, I forget about my eyes. I'm so, I have one assignment. I have to stop the play up the middle. And that's what was lost on the play call. Well, and another thing too, it's like, have we seen Nico make a guy? I, I can remember one play last year against yeah, Nebraska Purdue. where, yeah. where well, he yeah. made a guy miss yeah. in the open field. Mm-hmm. If that's Caleb Brown or, or Wetchen, or Wetchen who yeah. I, I want to get, see Wetchen get the ball more after that yeah. kick return. He looks like a real player. Yeah, he's quick. Uh, if that's one of those guys, they have a 15% chance of getting that with how it played out. Mm-hmm. With Regani, the play is immediately dead. Oh, I'm well, right when we it got to him and you could see who was there. I'm like, no way. Yeah. Like, I was like, that can't be. And that's just a moment where, you know, I don't want to be too hard on Brian because you're starting to see how we can win with this offense. And he's playing with such a low deck. That you, right. you have to, you know, do something unexpected. Yeah. But it's just one of those plays where you go back and like, what the hell was the idea? Right. Yeah. And the film room is just gonna be just tough. Yeah. Well, I think I, other, I think what thing what annoys me is like if you see, I mean, it wasn't a heavy box either. I mean, no. they're kind of pulled up, but you know, just by alignment, you know that DN's not coming. Mm-hmm. You know he's not diving down. Right. So if you're getting that a flat block with safeties playing behind it, you're playing a three on one with Regani moving laterally. Right. Yeah. I think another, made, another call too that really kind of pissed me off was you're running the ball. Every single play in the first half, you've you're consistently under center with, you know, two tight ends and a fullback, and it's scaring the crap out of Wisconsin because in the first drive you're getting push and movement, and it feels like Caleb's like and Lashawn are both like one missed tackle away from actually getting like twenty yards on most runs. Yeah, you have this like overhanging thing of these safeties are like, I'm making the plays in these run games, or linebackers like I I was in a big hole there. Yeah, and they're they're stressed in the back end of how the run game was going. If you're going to take a deep shot in the second half, don't do out of five wide, no chance to run the ball. The, we came out and we're like, all right, what's the simplest way to show that we're going to throw deep? And it was such a lazy call to go five wide, run vertical routes, and then have Deacon throw the ball 75 yards. That wasn't even close. It was closer to the safety again, just like the Purdue game. It's like, you you established this jab, like we mentioned. You have this like run game that's putting so much pressure on anyone around the line of scrimmage and coming up. Use that to your if you want to take a shot, use that. Play action off an under center power counter or a zone play. Like if you want to really back them up and really make them think, use use that play. Don't use the five wide, like Kirk goes, Oh, see, he can throw it 70. Now don't play hard. You know, don't play fast. Yeah. It's like, well. That didn't look like anything else we've done. So what? It, you're simplifying their thoughts. Yeah. You're simplifying their reads. Play the aggressive call that scares the crap out of them. And then you actually can, you know, then their feet slow down. Because they remember that out of this set, we had a 40-yard bomb that I was late to. And maybe we don't complete it, but at least they're thinking differently. The marrying would have worked a lot their, better. Their mind of like formations and how they come into a pre-snap read changes yeah a five wide doesn't do anything to your I, your ability to scare safeties yeah. like i did like the idea to take a shot there again though just going back to how they started playing our run game what would have actually been open there is like a, a, a 15 to 20 yard looper right you know you're running something across the field uh where you have these you know c gap defenders coming down so like they're not getting depth they're not playing something deeper. Actually, yeah uh, but it did feel like I remember watching, like, you know, watching it back, like, man, if this was a moment to attack deep, mm-hmm. you know, if you could execute just one play right. at that high level, could have been the killer. It could have been the killer. Yeah. Uh, but that's why I've always just had an issue with five wide. Yeah. You know, if you have a, a, a QB who has a threat of run, then it does make scary. sense. Yeah. Uh, but you, you just really let the defense off the hook. They can base out. Mm. You're pretty much limited to hitting the, a stick route because they're getting into their drop so fast. Right. Five wide, I get it because you we came out in 11 personnel, running back tight end. Mm-hmm. So then when you, you go when you, have when, more, you, when you go yeah. to five wide, you you have them check out of their play usually so you can get yeah. a base look. But when you go to base, you know, it's a typical attack. Mm-hmm. And again, they're playing pass right away, so it's going to be a tight window. Right. So five wide, it's... 
one of those things you saw Belichick use a lot. And I feel like still that's what Brian pulls that from is a Belichick mm-hmm. idea. But what right. Belichick would always do is then motion running back in. Yeah. And then still like you get it, you get them the base out in the five wide, but then yeah. you have the threat of run. Yeah. So I'd like to see us do that more. Mm-hmm. I think, and then we haven't brought him up yet. We're this far in the episode. We have to talk about Tory Taylor. Yeah. And I think he had two kicks when his feet were in the end zone that went landed on their th- opposite 35. Yeah. And 30 yards and boomed them. Like, yeah. It wasn't, the guy was waiting on it and we still had time to run down there. And all the times he pinned him, like, if you eliminate his performance, like, I don't know if we win that game. Yeah. The, well, that, that was, not, again, when you're following along on the phone, and all of a sudden you see 65 yard punt, 61 right. yard punt, like, holy cow. And there's yeah. no return. Yep. And that's, a, we're going into the rest of the season with no QB and no receiving threats. Right. It, we're, we're still likely going to win, win the Big Ten West because we can run the ball yeah. and you have an unbelievable punter. Right, and a really it's, good place kicker too. Yeah, like, and really good, and he, had, he had a, Drew had a great game too. And it was, the best part about that was just like, most kickers, you feel like they're not a part of the team. Yeah. Like they just kind of like, oh, I hope I don't mess up. So yeah. I was going to that locker room and have to deal with the rest of the team. Yeah. Stevens hit the kick to go up by two scores and he turned to the sideline and everyone's just flexing at him and he turns back and flexes to them. It's like <laughs> the kicker's like, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That is such an awesome moment to see yeah. your kicker. Well, the like, punter is like same, same right. vein. It's Special like the, teams is a part of this team. Yeah, it's a good part of the team. Like yeah. these guys are like killers and they're like, the team like respects them and you can yeah. like feel that vibe. Like yeah. that it's, it's value. It's a, third, it's, it's a third of the game and in some games it's more. Right. And the fact that we're good in that aspect. Not just good, unreal. Yeah. Like, best in the country. Right. That And you marry that with the whole idea. Yeah. You know, this is all one idea. It's a, it's a giant mm-hmm. array. And Kirk knows how to get it done. Yep. Time to move on? Yeah. Let's do it. We are happy to announce a new sponsor for the ANF podcast. The ANF podcast is sponsored by Eye Surgeons Associates, proudly serving Eastern Iowa and Western Illinois for all your eye care needs for over 40 years. Hate week. It is. For um, us for us in Minneapolis, this is the biggest game of the year every year. Yeah. And we've been up here for 10 years. We've lost at one time and it feels like we're five and four. Right. Yeah. It. That one loss still sticks with us big time. Yeah. Um, and it's I get so nervous before this game. Yeah, every year. Because after that 2014 loss, I heard it from every single person I know. Yeah, people didn't like college Girls football. Girls who don't even follow college football. Like, how about those Gophers? Like, shut up. Yeah. It's it's a big game. And for the scope of the season, too, you have Gophers at home, you know, this week. Then you have a bye week. And then you look at those last four games. You know, Nebraska, the Illini, Northwestern, Rutgers. Some of those teams not, might not be playing for anything. Some of those teams just completely, you know, want the season to end. Yeah. This is, feels like the last game where, and truly the Gophers too, they're in a very unique situation this moment under PJ. They got Wisconsin, Iowa, and Ohio State still on the schedule, and they're three and three. They could be two and four. They should he's, be two and four. He, since his first season, he's never had to pitch a team, you know, let's just have a good season. They've been in the West race other than 2020 every year since 2019. So he... It's a new kind of culture he has to facilitate where likely they're already out of the race with that type of schedule, but he has to keep them playing hard. And that's not an easy thing to do. Well, I think they kind of blew up on them in 2020 where they they were out of it early and they really did not play hard like the majority of that season. Well, and that, that's, that's one benefit to this game that I can you know feel good about going into is having to die for countries, we like to say, mm-hmm. is at the top of the list when you play Iowa. Yeah. We're never going to let you take a playoff. Mm-hmm. Offense, defensive-wise, it's going to be contact every play. There's no physicality. Yeah. Physicality is going to reign supreme, and it's going to be four quarters worth, and we're, you're never really even going to see us blink when it comes to it. No. You're going to see it, an absolute car crash. We could have. That's what I loved about this last game, is how many plays did you see? Cooper's fourth down stop. Castro's uh, multiple tackles for loss. Yeah. They get up like it's no big deal. Yeah. And honestly, that's more psychologically damaging than a guy going crazy after a play like that. Oh, yeah. If it looks routine mm-hmm. and the whole team just goes, yeah, and they walk off, like, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and it's, it's scary. It's, it's a little, yeah, it's like you're almost dealing with like a psychosis on the other side. Mm-hmm. They don't even realize they're playing well. Yeah. And uh, that's, when you go into these Iowa games and guys are just flying up and killing you and then they're not saying a word. Mm-hmm. Not talking about not it. Not talking about it. They're just like, we're going to ready to do it again. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's definitely the mindset of this game. And I think Kirk and Brian need to smell blood 
in yeah. some way of their game plan early because they just came off of a game against Michigan where they got buried and it kind of ended, you know, any hope for them. If you come out and you take a 7-0 lead early in this game, you let the crowd get into it, you let that pressure set in, you let that doubt of this, that, that this team is for sure carrying doubt. Played Louisiana tough. They lost to Northwestern. They, you know, scraped one by against a year zero Nebraska team. Yeah. There, is, there isn't a lot of confidence in this team. And you can feel that through Caliak Manis. You can feel that through the defense. There's not, not, not a lot of fight in them right now. Bury them early. Because if a game starts and they feel like they're in a big environment and they kind of see the, you know, lie at the end of the tunnel, like, well, if we win this game, season's back on. Yeah. Like, we have a shot at the West Yeah, title. ranked one on the road. Right. You're, you're, you just beat Iowa for the first time since 1999. Yeah. Like, PJ's giving that speech in the locker room beforehand. You want to become a legend, you win this game. Yeah. Like, he's selling that. He's selling this moment. But... They still have that entire season that's what's you know happened so far in the back of their mind. So it, it's it's important to jump on them early. Well, I think uh, the fear behind us is PJ has actually developed a really good way of beating us. Mm-hmm. You know, he hasn't done it yet. Uh, last year, he likely should have won the game. Right. It wasn't for a Mo Ibrahim fumble. Mm-hmm. I don't think we ended up driving the field and, and scoring a touchdown to win that game. With Laporte out, yeah. With Laporte out. Once Laporte went out, our offense really fell apart. We had some makeables, you know, the Regani drop. Mm-hmm. Uh, just seemed like every time we got something going, we'd have a, a breakdown somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but Mo had an unbelievable game. I think they, had, I think it's the second straight season they ran for 300 yards and lost. Yeah. Uh, but what PJ's done a really good job of, and it's you know it's antithetical to what we just saw from Wisconsin, is they are not afraid to just hand the ball off every single time. And mm-hmm. we're going to come out against these guys, especially when they go. They're not going to run a lot of two tight ends. I don't think. I think they're going to try and keep the boxes light. You'd see it more often. Like late in these last few games, they're going a little more heavy sets. But yeah, they want probably. I think they're going to want to make make a play light box against yeah. us. So I think they're going to go more to single tight end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when the way they execute it, and we're going to, you know, what they've done a really good job of is they've taken away our slant game mm-hmm. because they have shotgun handoffs that can hit front side and back side, mm-hmm. uh, and then they also always have the option to QB read. We really have a difficult time taking away backside D yeah. or at least eliminate it from how we attack them. Their best runs are actually backside flow runs. Yes. Where our backside C-gap defender just generally is a DN who's 260 pounds versus a line tackle who's 330. Yep. And they've had that backside flow so much in you know previous years where I see it again this year too. I Their, line, their tackles are their best run blockers. Our DNs are probably the smallest they've ever been in this series. And I do anticipate that they're going to have – about the same success Wisconsin did in the run game, they'll, they'll probably be less, you know, Braylon Allen type of plays where he's just running over Schulte. But the key is that PJ is not going to get sick of running. Yeah. Wisconsin, their biggest issue is that they thought they were there, right? And they thought we we're going to throw the ball 50 times. PJ's not going to get sick of running. It's going to be a third and four on our 45 yard line. He's going to run it. It's going to be a third and six on our 20-yard line. He's going to run it. Yeah. He's going to try to get the fourth and one. Yeah. And actually, the issue with Parker's defense is that we never go nuclear. So if it's like a fourth and one on our 40-yard line, he has a hard time justifying justifying blitzing everybody. Well, it's actually funny because in this game two years ago, we did that. And mm-hmm. Coquif slung out for a 40-yard right. touchdown. We've kind of given up on that type of defense. We, we went there a little bit against that in their, this most recent game, that with Cooper. Right. right. That was there was a nuclear look from Wisconsin. Though, where that was, was deeper in our red zone, though. Yeah, true. Uh, but um, that's where PJ's had success, though. It's kind of calling our third down bluffs. Right. And we, he's, had, he's done a really good job of being able to attack B-gap mm-hmm. with speed uh, against right. our, our, our D-lineman. I actually think you're going to see a lot more zone in this uh, rendition of the game or have a lot more uh, uh, me- if we do run man to man, it'll be single high where Schulte falls into that, you know, late middle right. zone where he actually can play the run. I don't think you're going to see a lot too high in this game because we're going to be afraid of that one, that uh, third down run. Right. Their third down run has been really good against us. It's been very solid. And if you always have the idea that you're going with four downs, you can trick us because that's really where our defense falls apart mm-hmm. is third down run when we run man to man because our guys are so locked in on the guy in front of them right. that they don't play the you run. You have a true five on five in the box. Yes. Yeah. And like, if you get a D end up field, right. all of a sudden you can hit B gap with speed and that, that's 100%. A, a real problem. So actually, to, this wasn't the plan for this Minnesota team. No. Their game plan to start the season, they, they said they reevaluate in the spring and in the summer. 
what is the strength of our team? And they came in with Brockington, Ottman Bell, uh, Daniel Jackson, Crooms, Crooms, Elijah Spencer, Brevin and Spanford. Brevin Spanford. So they had this six-man receiving group. Threw that, for 300 yards against felt, Wisco. They and, felt very good late yeah. in that season. They felt coming in, it was like, we're going to be actually a, a throw-it-around team. We're going to change our – we're not going to be the surface academies run the ball 40 times anymore. Calic Monis is good. We're going to throw it around. They threw the ball 44 times against Nebraska in week one. They have thrown the ball more than 15 times twice since the next five games. And that was when they were behind. They've, they're back to, we're going to run the ball, throw the ball about 12 to 13 times a game. We're going to run the ball 40. Mm -hmm. So they've entered right back in the 2022, 2021 Minnesota. But their personnel up front and then the running back room is, it's still good. They still have very good tackle play. Their guard center guards, the worst it's been since probably 2018, I'd say, in terms of like NFL talent. Yeah. And their running back room is, it's solid, but it isn't the just same. Just young. It's just a young group that. They'll be good in two or three years. Yeah. It's still I, got two guys good, that you really, but, yeah. you know, Zach Evans is a really good player and Darius, Darius Taylor, Taylor yeah. is a very good player as well. But it's just, they're fr retro freshmen. So we'll see against an Iowa defense how those guys look. They've looked very good in moments, but. This is the best defense they've played uh, to this point. Well, I think uh, a product of why these spread teams end up usually, I mean, they've, they've ran the ball well against us, but I think mm -hmm. that was more, they had an unbelievable guard center guard last year. Right. And they really dominated between the nose tackle. Yeah. To and, the point where we actually thought Black was a bad D tackle. Yeah. You watch back 2022 Minnesota. He got dominated. He got dominated. Shannon got dominated. Logan Lee got dominated. Right. And that if, if, if Iowa loses that in that spot, mm -hmm. it's very rare we win a game. Right. And that they they completely control that game, guard center guard. Yeah, I don't believe that's going to happen this time. And, and with this uh, shotgun run scheme, if you can't block that area, if you can't run inside zone at a super high clip, mm -hmm. it does fall apart pretty fast. Yeah, and that's where if you're going to watch this game, watch how their double teams operate. Right? Are they getting movement on the one technique or the three technique? Yeah, and are they climbing to the backer? Yeah, and the key is in Black also looked like he injured his shoulder late in the Wisconsin game. If he He's on a depth chart on Monday when we're recording this. If he's out, the key thing you need to watch, because Graves is going to replace him at the one tech, and that's not a step down. It's actually probably an equal type of level of play when you have Graves and Logan Lee at D-tackle. But the key thing to watch at the start of possessions, are we going to our backup D-tackles? Mm -hmm. Because that's going to be the key to the game if Black is out. That you have these backup D-tackles coming in. Where we go to the backups. The third possession of the first half the second possession of the second half. If those guys can hold up and Minnesota's guard center guard can't dominate our backup D tackles, we will win this game. Yeah. If Black is playing, that's a great sign for us. But still the backups with Pittman, he probably got exposed the most in this Wisconsin game of the season so far. It's still the key thing for, I think, any fan is just watch the rotation of our backup D tackles because over the last you know, seven years of watching Iowa football, when the backup D tackles come in, the defense generally gets moved on for the first 40 yards of that drive. Yeah. Before the starters come back in. Yeah. So it's something to watch. Well, I think, I mean, speaking of which, if you could get Noah Shannon back for this game. Right. I couldn't think of a more timely game for him to play. I can't imagine that. Yeah. I mean, if you have uh, Black, who's if he's out. Right. And Shannon just gets to be a plug and play, fresh as ever. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be just a great moment for this Well, team. imagine if Black can play too. And yeah. you can just really... Well, if, if if Black can play and Shannon's playing, mm -hmm. I think the the line should move significantly. Right. Honestly, that, yeah. that 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 this game will be decided on how well our D tackles play. Right. Because that that's just what Minnesota's going to force you to do. Right. It's there. Can you stop inside? You're zone? talking about a jab that Iowa had against Wisconsin. Minnesota's jab is that play. If they're they if they lack that consistent movement in their guards and their guard against our D tackles, their offense falls apart very quickly. Yeah. Well, and and like you said, Ethan. He looks very comfortable when he's on the move. Mm -hmm. he, he's a lot like what we've seen from uh, Deacon and Petrus. Is right. He's a strong arm kid, but when you get to this D1 level, a lot of guys just think that's that's how you play D1 football is you, you just rope, you rope the ball. Yep. And he's struggled with accuracy because of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think something when he when he does move, it allows him, I don't know what it is, but just there's more fluidity. rhythm to his throw. It's yeah. the fluidity. But when he's just like a put his back uh, – back foot down and then trying to drill a ball outside the numbers. Yeah. We could see a ball he leaves inside for a pick in that play. There's a, and I think they're really going to take the ball out of his hands in this one right. because they know that, you know, we're one 
bad eighth and throw away. This is right. not a man-to-man -man team you're playing. Right. You leave a ball inside. Every ball that goes awry has the possibility to be intercepted and be pick six. Yeah. And eliminating that possibility is going to be a key factor for PJ's game plan. Yeah. Um, I think it's time to move into their defense and what we yeah. expect from the offense. Rossi's basically, he got put in place in what, late 2018? Yeah. Um, after they got smoked by the Illini. Um, he's essentially taking a Phil Parker mindset to playing Minnesota football. So he's simplifying their amount of plays they run. They're trying to play fast. They're trying to play a generally not a very aggressive set in first and second down, and it's consistently the same type of look for the entire game on first and second down. He makes his hay of hopefully we can, you know, dry into a third and six, and I'm going to get a creative look on that down where I'm bringing, you know, five to six possible rushers, dropping into weird zones, rushing three. Um, but this is actually his worst front seven he's had at Minnesota. And it's weird to see it, you know, occur so late in the PJ era where actually there's kind of a recruiting gap in their linebackers. They had some transfers out at linebacker. They could right. have had Braylon Allen back, or, or Oliver back yep. this year. And but when you turn on the film, you 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 see a lack of a pass rush, which they've had issues in the past. You don't see great D end or D tackle play, uh, and their linebackers are just a, a true step down from what they've had in previous years. And that entire front seven, you know, they can't stop the run well and can't get you know negative plays in this type of defense. It's played out that they've given up you know high score games to Northwestern, high score games to Louisiana. Eastern Michigan, who can't really move the ball that well, has moved, moved the ball like pretty consistently against him. Rossi's a good coordinator, but this is his toughest challenge he's had on just ter in terms of personnel who he has on the team. Well, two points I want to make is uh, it's obvious that I always highlighted this game as a must win for since PJ has been there. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's a, a vendetta by Brian against PJ or what it is. Right. But we usually come into this game with five or six novel plays that we haven't seen all year. Mm -hmm. And they seem to hit at a, a very high rate. And I think a product of that is how they play on the defensive line. Right. Even when they've had, you know, good defense lines with like, you know, Boye Mafe and Carter Coughlin, mm -hmm. they still haven't pressured the pass well. And it's because they kind of employ what Iowa does where they're more of a bull rush. Focusing you know, on contain contain the, the pocket, pocket, stopping the run. And when you have yeah. that scenario, we are more likely to take chances in the passing game because we don't think you're going to get pressure. Just by breakdowns. You know, it's going to be a, a lot longer developing play, mm -hmm. usually in these passing situations. So we'll go to a longer uh, pass play. Yeah. Um, likely, even though we're going to, you know, not throw the ball very much, when I think we do, you will see more unique Success. calls uh, and more success than we've seen in the past two games. Yeah. You, Another thing, too, is Minnesota, since Rossi's played, I mean, the decord, they're, they're a very reactionary defense. Mm -hmm. If you if they see what they like, you know, you're going to run, come out and run a base lead, a uh, base counter. They flow insanely fast, especially from the safety position. Mm -hmm. And linebackers play fast. They they play fast all over. They're the place. influenceable, very influenceable. Yeah. They're they're playing with their eyes. They're and they're not trying to play too safe. Mm -hmm. you know, I've seen plays where their safeties will come from 12 yards and try and make a play at the. Uh, line of scrimmage and miss the tackle and the right. roll for 20. It's like, man, just don't do that. Yeah, just power down. Yeah. Just power down. Um, but that can work in two ways. That It's had success against Iowa when we tee them up for, you know, a basic first and 10 run and mm -hmm. they blitz into it or they react fast to it. They can get stops in this manner. Right. So and it's going to be very have, interesting how we attack them. Yeah. Well, Newbin last year, he was making run stops two yards off the play. Yeah. And we didn't dominate on the line of scrimmage last year. We didn't have the the wins you would need to put Newbin in a position where he actually can't make that play because he doesn't have just a lane. He, yeah. Hopefully in this game, we can eliminate Newbin's you know, press by having a wider hole, which gives the running back a two-way go to make that play. Yeah. Because Newbin is the best player on this team. He will make the NFL. If you turn on any Minnesota game this year, if you want to watch a play be made, it's by Newbin. Yep. He is you know, going to be an all-Big Ten player. But – he truly is the only guy right now if uh, Lindenberg is out for them in the front seven that I was going to try to avoid as much as possible. Wally, their cornerback, had a strong start to his career. Uh, he is susceptible to double moves. So if you see you know, a deep shot, most likely it's probably going to be Anderson on Wally because Wally likes to gamble. Uh, we used it against him against Charlie Jones in 2021. Uh, I saw North, North, North Carolina, Carolina beat him on a double move. Yeah. He, he's trying to make plays. He, he punched out a ball against Nebraska to try to make a play, but he's also susceptible to that because he's he's kind of constantly thinking about making that pick. Yeah. So I think if we do target a guy, even though their corner's worse than Wally, I think if you actually want to make a double move, you're going to put it on him. Yep. So it, it'll be interesting to see. And yeah. I, the key 
fact you can bring up too about the linebacker possibly playing. What yeah, you- Lindenberg hasn't played all season. He was, I remember when we watched him later, he came out later Very good in the player. season. He's the best linebacker they've had under uh, PJ besides maybe Kamal Martin, but he's right. I mean, as early, as early as he was making plays, it's like, man, this guy's actually he can really, play. He's a player. Yeah. Uh, but he hasn't played all season. He's coming back from a hammy, I believe. Yeah. They're optimistic he comes back. That would be a, a, a massive addition. But again, how I was going to play this game, it's going to be how well do we move this D line around? And they right. might have Bow out, who's their best D tackle. Mm-hmm. They haven't really, uh, again, haven't rushed the passer well. So you're going to be, we're going to feel pretty comfortable what we do. Right. Uh, I expect a fair amount of play action this game too. Just mm-hmm. given the speed of their DNs, I think we're going to feel comfortable getting Deacon on the edge, trying yeah. to take advantage of some easy completions for him. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're going to, I think they're going to be very aggressive in how they align. Right. I think it's from the start they're not going to let Iowa just kind of melt the game away. They're mm-hmm. going to want to try and give their offense a good field position. I, don't, I think this game that's going to be their initial prerogative mm-hmm. is to set their offense up for success. And if you can be aggressive yeah. against our sets. The thing is, I don't think they can play aggressive with their D line in their front seven. I think if you, caught, if you play, if you play aggressive with that type of front seven and you have a double team move, a guy, you know, two gaps, he might wash up four players if yeah. they're coming downhill. Yeah. So it'd be interesting if they back up and say, all right, eat six, we'll, we'll play to the red zone, maybe get a field goal stop. But I think Iowa almost wants them to play aggressive because with our power runs and counters, we might have the shot to break one of those 80 yarders. Yeah. I'm, I'm, my worry is that if they go to the just taking away C gap mm-hmm. and we start running the count, like again, our, our, our counter is going to be running the counter to block out C gap, but then Newman's feeling fast. Right. You know, are they just going to have enough guys around the line of scrimmage where our run game's just not going to be there? Yeah. If it's a 10 man box, mm-hmm. essentially, with how Newman quickly Newman fills, yeah. you're going to eventually need a receiver to make a play somewhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think being at home changes Brian's. Uh, feelings about play calling i think momentum it goes into brian's confidence into his truly yeah you see brian lose confidence and gain confidence being at home yeah and i think if he finds a moment where he feels like they're overplaying and he wants to take a lead early i could take i could see him taking a shot within the first quarter yeah of going like if you're in play this fast this early i'm not gonna run let's just see if we have it right too and we just scare you one time with it so i think it will be that that safety depth and that aggressiveness is something to 100 percent keep an eye on and I expect Brian to counter it fairly quickly because yeah. I don't, I don't think he's scared of this front seven. Yeah. And so if you're not scared of the front seven in terms of pass rush or you know making a play on your quarterback, like there's no downside to make it, trying to throw a ball up. Yeah. Like I think Wisconsin had the personnel that could eliminate those ideas a lot faster. Yeah. And their secondary is better too. Yeah. I think we end with a prediction then. Yeah. Yeah. I think I mean the key thing here is going to remember as a fan is if this turns quickly, you know. You get a a broken play by Minnesota office where they take a 7-0 lead. Yeah. You get us turning the ball over early. Yeah. This is going to be a sweated out game. Yeah. You're likely going to see us not perform well in offense. Michigan State. Exactly. That's uh, that's exactly what I have in mind. Mm -hmm. If you go down early in this game, Mm -hmm. they're not going to do you any help. Pressure's going to fall on us very fast. Right. They're not going to do you any help on offense either. Yeah. If they take a 7-0 lead, PJ's going to run the ball 40 times. It's going to be exactly what we just saw us do to Wisconsin. Yeah, the flip script. Yeah. So... When it comes to predictions, I think it's going to be imperative that we take an early lead. Right. And we have in this series for, for a long time. Yeah. And I think just I know the moment that's going to have it, Kinnick. Mm-hmm. Like when Kinnick gets a home game that's huge. Yeah. It's a, a, Minnesota's like, oh, might be our chief rival now. Right. I don't know if that's just a feeling that we have, but it feels like when we play them, it's yeah. it's up there. Yeah. And it's Wisco. Iowa State. Iowa State. But Minnesota. Because yeah. I feel like the Iowa crowd just hates PJ. Yeah. <laughs> like now it's he's kind of become the chief guy they want to beat. Right. It's going to be a big ass game. If you can take an early lead, I mm-hmm. think we we can kind of sail off into the sunset with this game by running the ball. Mm-hmm. And again, that whole will factor. If you know we take a a ten o lead, right? Brandon, that sounds like the most points of all time. Yeah. <laughs> but if you take a ten o lead, you know this could snowball on them. One hundred percent. We could win pretty comfortably. There's just a reality knowing, where, knowing the reality of how Minnesota is going to play this game, how they're going to, you know, shorten the game, shorten the game, and also just put a, an onus on field position. Like mm-hmm. them getting to the 45 and punting is going to be a huge win in this moment game, right? Because of how li- lack of explosion we have, right? And truly, they actually have a, a really good kicker as well. Yeah, PJ's actually had main issue against Iowa is that fun, uh, special teams have been a disaster for them. Yeah, in this series, you know, missed kicks and massive moments. They actually have an NFL kicker. Kessages. 
really you can good. kick a 55 yard or 53 yard pretty comfortably. comfortably. So that, that is a, an, another wrinkle to this game that make it more interesting. I do my I I, I again though I I called I texted you about this Wisconsin I'm like I don't think Wisconsin's getting in the end zone. Right. I don't know what it is. I just Morikai was their only offense I saw. Yeah. And I, we we've handled QB run well. Mm-hmm. Going to this one. Just knowing the Kinnick crowd that's going to be out, mm-hmm. I think they have a very difficult time getting in the end zone. Mm-hmm. And how aggressive we've gotten outside, as long as we don't bite on a double move, right. it's going to be, if they even when they do have success, like right. we'll, they'll have success on two or three drives. Yeah. I think it's going to result in field goals. I, yeah. if, I, if I had to predict, I, th- I think 16 to 9. Yeah. It's my final I like that. Yeah. I'm going to go 13 to 7 Iowa. And just same in line. And I think we didn't talk about it, but Ethan, his confidence is a key to this game, I feel like. Yeah. And they do have some receipt. Like Daniel Jackson's a real player. Yeah. If we mentioned Crooms like really good. who do you anticipate to them to target in the passing game? Crooms over the middle at, against Castro, just like Paul against Castro last game. And Daniel Jackson on deep routes. Yeah. They they consistently want to go to a double move with him. He's a really crisp route runner. Sets if, up really well. If you are in the stadium and you see a deep ball to Daniel Jackson in your head as a ball's in the air going, this is the game. Yeah. Because – if they miss those plays and they don't hit the double move to him, they're just not going to have enough offense. Well, I think it's going to be it's coming down it's going to be a margins game. It's going to come down to a double move for Daniel Jackson and maybe a third down to Crooms in a third and ten moment where it it's a closeout moment or it's a we need the ball back right now in a good spot. I think Phil's going to hammer home to Jamari and Cooper because Ethan has difficult times accuracy yeah. with accuracy issues. Just stay over the top, right? If if you if we're gonna get beat by deep ends between the twenties, or curl routes, eat it, eat it. That's right. fine. He but has to make, hit those. But make those throws. Make right. make those throws first. Uh huh. And then just don't get beat by the double move. Right. At the thirty five yard line. Yeah. Want to make our picks? Yeah. Let's do it. So I went two and one last week. Uh, that's now six and one over the last two weeks. If anyone's counting. <laughs> I went two and zero oh last week, and that's three and one. So what is that for us? Nine and one over the last two weeks. Yeah. Starting to finally see the board after being blind for a long time. You want to go first? Yeah. So Wisconsin's playing at Illinois. Uh, I'm going to take Wisconsin minus two and a half. I think this is largely a, an overreaction to uh, Mordecai being out. What we saw from their backup QB, he's actually got quite a bit of game to him. He doesn't have the legs that Mordecai does, but he's going to be able to keep them on schedule. And I was mm-hmm. actually very impressed with Wisconsin's receivers. Illinois is going to force them to throw the ball. I think that Wisconsin actually will have a, a big game in the air against Illinois. Mm-hmm. And then I think Wisconsin's defense, from what I saw from them, they, they have a good defense. Uh, I think their defense is far better equipped to stop the spread offense, which is what Illinois runs. Mm-hmm. Um, my next pick is Rutgers, Indiana, under 42. I cannot stray away. Rutgers has let me down a lot lately with their unders. Mm-hmm. But at Michigan State, Rutgers under was beautiful until there was three turnovers in like yeah. a quarter. Yeah. I think this game is going to be super lower scoring. When I saw it was 42, I was like, holy cow. Because Indiana played Ohio State. Like, they stopped Ohio State. Indiana's offense. scoring less points than Iowa, too. Yeah. So so that, 42 points, probably a bit of a trap line, but I'm going to mm-hmm. bite. Yeah. Uh, and my last one is Iowa minus four. I just, I'm just feeling the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, I know what it's going to be like when we step into that kind of crowd. Mm-hmm. This is an Iowa team that has a chance at a Big Ten title. It's going to be a serious moment. Mm-hmm. The crowd's going to feel that if there is any sign of weakness shown by that Minnesota team. Mm-hmm. This could be a game where Kinnick could just jump on them and we take an early lead and we run away. Mm-hmm. I still believe that even in a close game, we have a chance to cover minus four as well. Yep. Um, I'm going to double your Wisconsin pick. I think their backup QB looks solid. Um, I was really surprised with how actually how talented Wisco's skill was between Bryson Green and Pauling. Braylon Allen's is still a stud. They line to make some plays in special teams and beat a Maryland team that's probably overrated. Mm-hmm. And now they're considered back. I've watched that team play, you know, five games fully. I bet on the. I'm so glad Maryland lost. I was so sick of them. I was like, they're not good. Yeah, but now you put into a moment of, you know, Wisconsin in a, a must, sit, you know, must win situation. Bima got Chris fired by beating them last week in this game, last year in this game. Fickle knows I have to win this game. Yeah. I can't go do exactly what my predecessor did and lose to Iowa and the Illini in the same season. Last year I can't. So like the onus is on them. They'll figure out that the run game is more important than they had. You know, they're going to look at their stats like, we threw the ball 50 times. Like, we're going to get the ball, the ball Braylon Allen 30 times this game. That'll mm-hmm. be the difference. Um, and my next pick, my last pick, will be Clemson minus three and a half. Miami's in free fall mode after their complete debacle two weeks ago. Uh, Van Dyke is in uh, a leg cast or a bandage where he's limping around. You know, obviously a strong QB for Miami. 
I think Clemson's still underrated. I lost money on them two weeks ago against Wake Forest, but watching the game against Florida State, they're a real team. They have a complete squad. They can run the ball. They can, the QB's good. They have a strong defense. Miami's not to their caliber. I think three and a half is stealing money with an injured QB in Van Dyke. I think that it was open at two and a half. Van Dyke was hurt and only moved up a point. She moved up four points, three points. So I, I like that bet as well. So only two bets this week, but hopefully we keep the train rolling. Quick thing we want to go into. I'm actually just going to take my time on this one. So obviously, gigantic game at Kinnick Stadium this weekend. Uh, we've went into it a couple times on this podcast already, but you're going to have an insane uh, atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a, a team that realizes you have a, a Big Ten West title right in front of you. I think we're projected at 75% chance to win the Big Ten at this yeah. moment. Bunch of momentum in the team. I think what we need to have happen from the crowd is understand what team you're dealing with here. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a coach of almost a, a quarter of a decade. Yeah. You know, he's given us his life. He's given us his son's life to him. He's put up a lot of our shit for a lot of, a lot of this season, the last couple of seasons. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for an absolute disastrous loss at home against Nebraska, we'd be back-to-back -back Big Ten West champs. Regardless what you think of the conference, that's the Iowa football being in the Big Ten title game two years in a row. Mm -hmm. You're now on a precipice of likely going to be in your third Big Ten championship. I guess it's going to be two in the last three years. Mm -hmm. uh, what we saw last time we were at home in a big game was Michigan State. It wasn't necessarily a big game. And we were coming off of the Penn State game where you had, you know, uh, Got smoked. let down of the season mm -hmm. and, you know, a horrible offensive output. Right. But what really zapped that game and zapped the team emotionally was how I'm sure the reaction they saw on Twitter regarding the team. You know, right. they played with very little emotion that Michigan State game. Mm -hmm. And then to compile that, the minute they had any sort of negative plays within the Michigan State game, they started having a, a crowd that was booing them. Yeah. And I think what we have to acknowledge here is these kids are people too. Yeah. Like they're social animals. Right. They're going to react negative to negative stimuli. Right. If you were at work, and you were just sitting at your desk <laughs> and you started getting booed. Yeah. Like hardcore. And they started calling out flaws in your work and they're being truthful about it. And it, it was actual issues with your work, what you're doing. Yeah. It would mentally impact you. Yes. And obviously these guys are strong mental willed players. They're D1 athletes, but with your, they're human. And that type and they're of- They're young too. They're and young. It's, it's 15, they're here in, you know, 10, 15,000. And I 000. hate the, the line, I'm not booing the players. I'm booing Brian and Kirk. You, there's no way for those players to discern that moment. No. They don't understand 20 years of futility on offense that's leading to these boos. They can't tell. They're on the sidelines. They can't separate themselves from that. Their own fans and their own student section is booing them. They're chanting fire Brian. These players have personal connections with the coach. They chose to play for Kurt Ferentz. They chose to play for Brian Ferentz. They hang out with these guys every single day. They have bonds with them. And you're cheering for them to be fired. You're saying, fire this guy. And One of their best the, friends and in life. And a lot of them, they think it's falling on them because of how they're playing. And they're getting them coaches fired. And no matter who you are, no matter how strong mentally you are, to have your own fans turn against you in that moment is, it has to be disheartening. It has to affect your level of play. It has to affect your confidence you have in yourself, the momentum you've built in. So for such a big game, for a, you know, a chance to have an 11-1 season, have a Big Ten West title, send Kirk off, you know, on one of his last seasons, don't boo the players. Well, I think what we have to say, too, in this moment, if you go down by seven, if you go down by four at any point in this game, and you stack multiple three and outs on top of each other, right? understand the style of play. Yes, it's disgusting. Yes, it's frustrating. Yeah. But just get behind the team. Yeah. The worst thing you can do to those guys is zap them at that moment. Right. Because then you want the badness to continue, boo them. That's how you get yeah. that more out of that. And guess what? If we go seven and five at the end of the season, we blow games to Minnesota Rutgers and Northwestern, and you're in the last game of the year, and we lose, boo all you want. Yeah, They didn't accomplish their goals. But while the team is in the process of possibly having a special season, never detract from that. Yes, The momentum on this team, you could feel in the locker room after the Wisconsin game, in through social media, which every single player is on 24-7, the IO positivity around this team, do not detract from that. Do not slow that train down. Do not yes. slow that bus down of positive momentum around this team. To feel like they're playing, you know, this girl style, but they're doing it our way. They're yeah. doing it the Iowa way. They're if tough, that ball ends in a punt, cheer for them. Right. That's a good thing with this team. Right. And just get behind the team. If you're in a stands and you someone's booing next to you in the row next to you, tell them to shut the hell up. Yes. I think that's, again, that's what we're trying to come across here. We are trying to accomplish positive vibes within Kinnick. Right. Do not steal what we have going. Yes. Get over yourself. Drop your ego. Yeah. Cheer drop, for the team. Drop your childish, you know, reaction to stuff. Yeah. Think through what you want to accomplish. 
and be positive because what you want to accomplish is a win, correct? Yeah. You want to win games. The last thing you to actually help win games is to boo your team. Yeah, it's antithetical. Right. That's that. That's our our speech. <laughs> All right, go Hawks. Go Hawks. 